the statement, I would like to assure the House, following the comments made at the start of questions, yeah. Yeah. I, tell you, I don't think it's quite appropriate with what I'm going to say. You ought to be ashamed. I really do. Before we move on to the first statement, I would like to assure the House, following the comments made at the start of questions, that there will be an opportunity to pay tribute to our friend and colleague, the late Jack Dromey. Yeah. And that will take place on Wednesday. I'm sure honourable and right honourable members will welcome the opportunity to pay tribute at that point. Yeah. I should inform the House that, given the brief period of time available to review the report, I shall be allowing the leaders of the opposition a little longer to question the Prime Minister than is usually the case, and I'm sure the Prime Minister will here wish a little longer as well at the beginning. I now come to the statement. Prime Minister. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Mr Speaker, with, with your permission, I would like to make a statement. And first, I want to express my deepest gratitude to Sue Gray and all the people who have contributed to this report, which I have placed in the Library of this House and which the Government has published in full today for everyone to read. I will address its findings in this statement, but firstly I want to say sorry. And I'm sorry for the things we simply didn't get right, and also sorry for the way that this matter has been handled. And it's no use saying that this or that was within the rules, and it's no use saying that people were working hard. This pandemic was hard for everyone. We ask people across this country to make the most extraordinary sacrifices, not to meet loved ones, not to visit relatives before they died. And I understand the anger that people feel. But, Mr Speaker, it isn't enough to say sorry. This is a moment when we must look at ourselves in the mirror and we must learn. And while the Metropolitan Police must yet complete their investigation, and that means there are no details of specific events in Sue Gray's report, I, of course, accept Sue Gray's general findings in full. And above all, her recommendation that we must learn from these events and act now. With respect to the events under police investigation, she says, and I quote, no conclusions should be drawn or inferences made from this other than it is now for the police to consider the relevant material in relation to those incidents. But more broadly, she finds that there is significant learning to be drawn from these events, which must be addressed immediately across government. This does not need to wait for the police investigations to be concluded. That is why we are making changes now to the way Downing Street and the Cabinet Office run, so that we can get on with the job that I was elected to do, Mr Speaker, and the job that this Government was elected to do. First, it is time to sort out what Sue Gray rightly calls the fragmented and complicated leadership structures of Downing Street, which she says have not evolved sufficiently to meet the demands of the expansion of Number 10. And we will do that, including by creating an office of the Prime Minister with a permanent secretary to lead Number 10. Second, Mr Speaker, it is clear from Sue Gray's report that it is time not just to review the Civil Service and Special Adviser Codes of Conduct wherever necessary to ensure that they take account of Sue Gray's recommendations, but also to make sure that those codes are properly enforced. And third, I will be saying more in the coming days about the steps we will take to improve the Number 10 operation and the work of the Cabinet Office, to strengthen Cabinet Government and to improve the vital connection between Number 10 and Parliament. Mr Speaker, I get it and I will fix it. And I want to say... And I want to say... To the people of this country, I know what the issue is. Yes, Mr Speaker, yes, yes. It's whether this government can be trusted to deliver. And I say, Mr Speaker, yes, we can be trusted. Yes, we can be trusted to deliver. We said that we would get Brexit done, Mr Speaker, and we did. 
and we're setting up free ports around the whole United Kingdom. I've been to one of them today, which is creating tens of thousands of new jobs, Mr Speaker. We said we would get this country through COVID, and we did. We delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and the fastest booster programme of any major economy, so that we've been able to restore people's freedoms faster than any comparable economy. And at the same time, we've been cutting crime by 14%, building 40 new hospitals and rolling out gigabit broadband, Mr Speaker, and delivering all the promises of our 2019 agenda so that we have the fastest economic growth of the G7. We have shown that we have done things that people thought were impossible, Mr Speaker, and, and that we can deliver for the British people. Mr Speaker, I, just, I remind the, the benches opposite. The reason we're coming out of COVID so fast is at least partly because we doubled the speed of the booster rollout. And I can tell the House and this country that we are going to bring the same energy and commitment to getting on with the job, to delivering for the British people and to our mission to unite and level up across this country, Mr Speaker, and I commend this statement to the House. I now call Keir Starmer, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank Sue Gray for the diligence and professionalism with which she's carried out her work. It's no fault of hers that she's only been able to produce an update today, not the full report. The Prime Minister repeatedly assured the House that the guidance was followed and the rules were followed. But we now know that 12 cases have reached the threshold for criminal investigation, which I remind the House means that there is evidence of serious and flagrant breaches of lockdown, including, including the party on the 20th of May 2020, which we know the Prime Minister attended, and the party on the 13th of November 2020 in the Prime Minister's flat. There can be no doubt that the Prime Minister himself is now subject to criminal investigation. The Prime Minister must keep his promise to publish Sue Gray's report in full when it is available, but it is already clear that the report discloses the most damning conclusion possible. Over the last two years, the British public have been asked to make the most heart-wrenching sacrifices, a collective trauma endured by all enjoyed by none. Funerals have been missed, dying relatives unvisited. Every family has been marked by what we've been through. And revelations about the Prime Minister's behaviour have forced us all to rethink and relive those darkest moments. Many have been overcome by rage, by grief and even guilt. Guilt that because they stuck to the law, they did not see their parents one last time. Guilt that because they didn't bend the rules, their children went months without seeing friends. Guilt that because they did as they were asked, they didn't go and visit lonely relatives. But people shouldn't feel guilty. They should feel pride in themselves and their country, because by abiding by those rules, They've saved the lives of people they will probably never meet. They have shown the deep public spirit and the love and respect for others that has always characterised this nation at its best. Our national story about COVID is one of a people that stood up when they were tested. But that will be forever tainted by the behaviour of this Conservative Prime Minister. By routinely breaking the rules he set, the Prime Minister took us all for fools. He held people sacrificing contempt. He showed himself unfit for office. His desperate denials since he was exposed have only made matters worse. Rather than come clean, every step of the way he's insulted the public's intelligence. And now he's finally fallen back on his usual excuse. It's everybody's fault but his. They go, he stays. Even now, he is hiding behind a police investigation into criminality, into his home and his office. Mr 
Mr Speaker, he gleefully treats what should be a mark of shame as a welcome shield. Yes. But, Prime Minister, the British public aren't fools. They never believed a word of it. They think the Prime Minister should do the decent thing and resign. Yes. Of course he won't, because he is a man without shame. Yes. And just as he has done throughout his life, he's damaged everyone and everything around him along the way. His colleagues have spent weeks defending the indefensible, touring the TV studios, parroting his absurd denials, degrading themselves and their offices, fraying the bond of trust between the government. Oh, oh. The member of South Ribble is my neighbour. I expect better from my neighbours. Kirsten. Fraying the bond of trust between the government and the public, eroding our democracy and the rule of law. Margaret Thatcher once said, the first duty of government is to uphold the law. If it tries to bob and weave and duck around that duty when it's inconvenient, then so will the governed. Mr Speaker, to govern this country is an honour, not a birthright. It is an act of service to the British people, not the keys to a court to parade to your friends. It requires honesty, integrity and moral authority. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me that this Prime Minister's lack of integrity is somehow priced in, that his behaviour and character don't matter. I have never accepted that, and I never will accept that. Whatever your politics, whichever party you vote for, honesty and decency matters. Our great democracy depends on it, and cherishing and nurturing British democracy is what it means to be patriotic. There are members opposite who know that, and they know the Prime Minister is incapable of it. The question they must now ask themselves is what are they going to do about it? They can heap their reputations, the reputation of their party, the reputation of this country on the bonfire that is his leadership, or they can spare the country from a Prime Minister totally unworthy of his responsibilities. It is their duty to do so. They know better than anyone how unsuitable he is for high office. Many of them knew in their hearts that we would inevitably come to this one day. And they know that as night follows day, continuing his leadership will mean further misconduct, cover-up and deceit. It is only they that can end this farce. The eyes of the country are upon them. They will be judged by the decisions they take now. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, there's there's a reason why he said absolutely nothing about the report. Presented uh, by, by this government and later put in the Library of the House earlier on today. That is because, Mr. Speaker, the report does absolutely nothing to substantiate the tissue of nonsense uh, he has just spoken. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Instead, Mr. Speaker, this, this leader of the opposition, a former Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Speaker, he spent, he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, as far as I can make out, Mr. Speaker. He, Mr. Speaker, chose to use the, chose to use this moment. He used this moment, Mr. Speaker, continually to prejudge a police inquiry. That's what he chose to do. Uh, he, he's reached his conclusions about it. I am not going to reach any conclusions, and he, and he would be entirely and uh, entirely wrong to do so. And, and I direct him again, Mr. Speaker, to what uh, Sue Gray says in her in her report about the conclusions that can be drawn uh, from uh, her inquiry about what the police may or may not do. Now, Mr Speaker, I have complete confidence uh, in the police and I hope that they will uh, will be allowed simply to get on with their job and I don't propose to offer any more commentary about it and I don't believe that he should either. And I I must say to him uh, that what I think the the country, with greatest respect to the benches opposite, what I think the country wants us all in this House to focus on is the issues that matter to them. And getting on, getting on, Mr Speaker, with taking this country forward, 
And, and Mr. Speaker, uh, today uh, we have delivered yet more Brexit freedoms with a new Freeport uh, in Tilbury, as I said, when he voted 48 times to take this country back into the, uh, to the EU. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have the most open society, most open economy. Mr. Speaker, this is, I think, what people want us to focus on. We have the most open society, most open economy in Europe because of the vaccine rollout, because of the booster rollout. And never forget, Mr. Speaker, that he voted, uh, he voted to keep us in the European Medicines Agency, which would have made that impossible. And today, Mr. Speaker, we are standing together with our NATO allies against the potential aggression of Vladimir Putin when he wanted, not so long ago, to install a Prime Minister, as Prime Minister, a Labour leader who would actually have abolished NATO, Mr Speaker. That's what he believes in. Those are his priorities. Well, I can say to him, he can continue with his political opportunism. We are going to get on, and I am going to get on with the job. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The COVID regulations impose significant restrictions on the freedoms of members of the public. They had a right to expect their Prime Minister to have read the rules, to understand the meaning of the rules, and indeed those around, them to have done, around him to have done so too, and to set an example in following those rules. What the Grey Report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules, or didn't understand what they meant, and others around him, or they didn't think the rules applied to Number 10. Which was it? It's a very important question. I want to hear the answer, even if other people don't. Prime Minister. Uh, no, Mr Speaker, that is not what the uh, Grey Report says. Uh, it is not what the Grey Report says. Uh, but if she, I, 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 I suggest that she waits to see uh, the conclusion of the inquiry. I now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say it's a pleasure to follow the former Prime Minister and perhaps her behaviour in office, like many that f- went before her was about dignity, about the importance of the office, of respect, of truthfulness. And the Prime Minister will be well advised to focus on those that have not dishonoured the office like he has done. Mr Speaker, we stand here today faced with the systematic decimation of public trust in government and the institutions of the state, and at its heart, a Prime Minister, a Prime Minister being investigated by the police. So here we have it, the long-awaited Sue Gray report. What a farce. It was carefully engineered to be a fact-finding exercise with no conclusions. Now we find it's a fact-finding exercise with no facts. So let's talk facts. The Prime Minister has told the House that all guidance was completely followed. There was no party. COVID rules were followed and that I believed it was a work event. Nobody, nobody believed them then. And nobody, nobody believes you now, Prime Minister. That is the crux. No ifs, no buts. He has willfully, willfully misled Parliament. It's bad enough. Inadvertent misled the House will be acceptable. Misled the House is not acceptable. Withdraw inadvertently. The Prime Minister inadvertently told the House on the 8th of December that no parties had taken place and then had to admit that they had. It's bad enough, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister's personal integrity is in the ditch, but this murky business is tainting everything around it. It is our intention to submit a motion instructing the Prime Minister to publish the Great Report in full. Will the Prime Minister obey an instruction by this House to publish as required? Mr Speaker, amidst allegations of blackmail by Tory whips, the members opposite 
have been defending the indefensible. Wait for the report, we were told. Well, here it is, and it tells us very little, except it does state that there were failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of number 10. It states that some events should not have been allowed to take place. That is the Prime Minister's responsibility. If there is any honour, any honour in public life, then he would resign. Where is this? And he laughs. And the Prime Minister laughs. We ought to remind ourselves in this House that 150,000 plus of our citizens have lost their lives. Family members that couldn't be with them. And that is the sight that people will remember. A Prime Minister laughing at our public. I extend the hand of friendship to all those that have sacrificed. I certainly do not extend the hand of friendship to the Prime Minister, who is no friend of mine. Where is the shame? Where is the dignity? Meanwhile, the police investigation will drag on and on. Every moment the Prime Minister stays, trust in government and the rule of law is ebbing away. The litany of rule breaking, the culture of contempt, the utter disdain for the anguish felt by the public who have sacrificed so much. What the public see is a man who has debased the office of Prime Minister, shrinked responsibility, dogged accountability and blamed his staff at every turn, presided over sleaze and corruption and tainted the very institutions of the state. In short, Mr Speaker, this is a man... Well, they can laugh. They can laugh. But the public know. The public know this is a man they can no longer trust. He has been investigated by the police. He misled the House. He must now resign. Order. You'll have to withdraw that last comment. Mr Speaker, I gave the evidence of the 8th of December. Order. Order. You're going to have to withdraw misled. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has misled the House. Unless you withdraw, I will have to stop, and that's not good. Just withdraw the words. I am standing up for my constituents that know that this Prime Minister has lied and misled the House. Give me the paper. Give me the paper. Inadvertently misled. I'll give you one more chance. As leader of the SNP, I don't want to have to throw you out. I'm going to give you this chance. Please. Please to power. That man has misled the House. Shut up. I'm sorry it's come to this, and I'm sorry that the leader of the party has not got the decency to just withdraw those words in order that this debate can be represented by all political leaders. Would you like to inadvertently? If the Prime Minister has inadvertently misled the House, then I will state that. Right, we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I'm grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for withdrawing uh, what he just said because he was wrong then and uh, he, I'm afraid, is wrong in, the, in, in his, his analysis. And I, 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 I apologise, as I've said, for uh, all the suffering that people have had throughout this pandemic and, uh, and for the anger that people feel uh, about uh, what has taken place in, in Number 10 Downing Street. But I've got, I've got to tell the, uh, the right honourable gentleman that for much of what he said, uh, his best course is simply to wait for the, uh, for the inquiry to be completed. Can I just say, I take it the honourable member has withdrawn it, the right honourable member. That the Prime Minister may have inadvertently misled the House. But, should, or, order. To help me, to help the House, you withdraw on your earlier comment and replace it with inadvertently. It's not my fault if the Prime Minister can't be trusted to tell the truth. Under the power given to me by Standing Order No. 43, I order the Honourable Member to withdraw immediately from the House. From the House. Anyway. It's, it's, it's all right, we don't need to bother. Right, let us move on. Andrew Mitchell. Does my right honourable friend recall? that uh, ever since he joined the party's candidates list 30 years ago, 
until we got him into number 10. He has enjoyed my full-throated uh, support. But I am deeply concerned by these events and, and very concerned indeed by some of the things he has said from that dispatch box and has said to the British public and our constituents. When he kindly invited me to see him ten days ago, I told him that I thought he should think very carefully about what was now in the best interests of our country and of the Conservative Party. And I have to tell him he no longer enjoys my support. Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I must tell uh, respectfully uh, my right honourable friend, great though uh, the admiration uh, is that I have of him, I, I simply think that he's uh, mistaken in his views, and uh, I, I urge him, to, I urge him to, to reconsider upon full consideration of the, of the inquiry. Dame Angela Riedel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister told us, and I'm quoting him, I have repeatedly been assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no COVID rules were broken. We now know that 12 of the 16 parties are subject to a police investigation and that of the remaining four, the Sue Gray report says this, that she's seen a serious failure to observe the high standards at number 10. She's seen failures of leadership, failures of judgment, and the Prime Minister thinks this is fine. So just how bad do things have to be before he takes personal responsibility, does what everybody in this country wants him to do, and resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, what we are doing is taking the action that I have described uh, to set up a Prime Minister's Department to improve the operation uh, of Number 10, and we will be taking further steps, Mr Speaker, in, uh, in the days ahead. Graeme Stewart. Speaker, the uh, inquiry has found there have been serious failings and has suggested there be changes in the, uh, the way that uh, Number 10 is run, and there is a real opportunity now to take forward this new office of the Prime Minister and ensure further Im improvements are made so that we can carry on delivering, because what the party's opposite hate is the fact that this government will carry on delivering on the things that matter most to people, while also making sure that the governance within Number 10 is improved. I thank my right honourable friend very, very much. I think he's completely right. I do think that uh, the opposition, uh, of course, uh, want to keep the, uh, their focus trained uh, on this. That's, the, that's their decision. I think, Mr. Speaker, I think, Mr. Speaker, what the people of this country want us to do is to get on with the job that they want us to do, and that is to serve them, Mr. Speaker, and to stop talking, frankly, about ourselves. Mr. Speaker, there is no word in the English language for a parent who has lost a child. No equivalent of widow or orphan for that particular horror. It is a loss that is literally beyond words, a loss that hundreds and thousands of parents have tragically experienced during this pandemic. Many had to bury their children alone. Many couldn't be there with them at the end. Meanwhile, number 10 parted. Yep. Does the Prime Minister understand? Does he care about the enormous hurt his actions have caused to bereaved families across our country? Will he finally accept that the only decent thing that he can do now is to resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, I do care deeply about the hurt that is felt ar across the country uh, about the suggestion that uh, things were going on in Number 10 that were in contravention of the, of the COVID rules. And I understand how deeply people feel about this and how angry uh, that they are. And, and, I, and I've apologised uh, several times, Mr Speaker, but I must say that I think we should wait for the outcome of the inquiry by, before jumping to the conclusions uh, that he has. And in the meantime, we should focus on the issues that matter to the British people. Caroline Notes. Speaker. The public and this House have been frustrated by having to wait for Sue Gray, wait for the Metropolitan Police, and today the Prime Minister has announced his new office at number 10. Please can you let this House know what specific structures are going to be put in place so that this House can hold it accountable? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, we will make sure that there is a new Permanent Secretary uh, to who will be accountable 
uh, to me. Uh, and uh, we will make sure that the codes of conduct that are applied both to SPADs and to uh, civil servants are properly enforced. And of course, uh, all of that will be properly communicated to the, to the House, Mr. Speaker. And what I want to see is much better uh, communication and, uh, and links between uh, Number 10 and the entirety of the House of Commons. And we will do that. Sir George Howard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, at the local Tesco store in my constituency, a constituent asked me, and it was in a tone more in sorrow than in anger, why doesn't the Prime Minister realise that as every day goes by, he damages the reputation of our country yeah. and, uh, abroad and round the world? Why, he said, doesn't the Prime Minister realise that? How would he respond to that constituent? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the reputation of our country around the world is built on the fastest vaccine rollout uh, in Europe, if not in all major economies. Uh, it is built on having the fastest growth, therefore, in the G7, and it is built on our ability to bring, uh, bring our allies together to stand up against Vladimir Putin. That is what the world is focused on, that is what I am focused on, and that, frankly, is what he should be focused on. Sir Bernard Jenkin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can my right hon. Friend, first of all, uh, remind the Leader of the Opposition and the Labour Party that the backbenches of the Conservative Party need no reminders about how to dispose of a failing leader. And can he also, when he is restructuring number 10, concentrate on the fact that the country wants results? The country, we can't see the point of such a large number 10 superstructure, that it needs to be slimmed down and streamlined. And can I commend his determination to restore, to restore, cabinet, to restore cabinet government, and it is on results over the next few months on which he will be judged. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I thank uh, my right honourable friend very much for that, and I, I think he's entirely right. And I'm uh, more than content to be judged, Mr Speaker, on the results that we've already delivered and the results that we will deliver. I'm sure that we will be greatly assisted uh, by the reforms of Number 10 uh, that I've outlined. Diane Abbott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Anybody who's actually read the Sue Gray report can only wonder what she was made to leave out. Will the Prime Minister give the House an undertaking that as soon as he is able, he will release the full, unredacted report to this House? Uh, Mr Speaker, Sue Gray has published uh, everything uh, that she can, and I propose that we wait until the conclusion of the, of the inquiry. Uh, but in the meantime, Mr Speaker, I think it... Uh, I think it peculiar that the report is being simultaneously uh, hailed as, as utterly damning, uh, but also uh, condemned for not uh, having enough in it. Um, it, can't, it can't be both. Vital fabricant. President Truman had on his desk, the buck stops here. So the Prime Minister was right to apologise for the events that happened in No. 10 Downing Street. Two weeks ago, I reminded Tom Harwood that Tony Blair suggested that there should be an Office of Prime Minister so that it could be governed not from 70 Whitehall but from the building itself. Could the Prime Minister tell me how he envisions the office will work? Will the Permanent Secretary be based in Number 10, controlling what civil servants do in Number 10? I, I'm grateful to, to my, my honourable friend, uh, very grateful. I think the House does understand, even if many people outside uh, don't, that Number 10 actually uh, hosts about more than 400 officials uh, on, a, on a busy day. Uh, they have a huge amount uh, to do, and, and we need to make sure, we need to make sure, no, Mr Speaker, they're working very hard. That's what they're doing. Uh, and, and we need to make sure uh, that there are proper lines of authority and that we sort out the, the command structures, and that's what we're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whatever the police decide, this uh, update, severely limited as it is, 
would be enough to persuade any other Prime Minister to resign. Yeah. 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 This Prime Minister could resign and salvage, salvage for himself a crumb or two of honour, or he may try to, dismay, to delay and take his party down with him. So, Mr Speaker, is it not clear that, with notable exceptions, his backbenchers should discover their backbones and sack him? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, Mr Speaker, I've, I've, I've answered several questions like that, and I, just, I must really ask him to look at the uh, report properly and also to wait uh, for the inquiry when it comes. Al Harper. Thank you very much, um, Mr Speaker. Um, we've been asked to keep some sense of perspective, and I think that's right. The question here is whether those who make the law obey the law. That's pretty fundamental. Um, uh, Many have questioned, including some of my constituents, the Prime Minister's honesty and integrity and fitness to hold that office. Now, in judging him, he rightly asked us to wait for all the facts. <clears throat> Sue Gray has made it clear in her update today that she couldn't produce a meaningful report with the facts. <coughs> so can I ask the Prime Minister the question that the Honourable Lady, the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington, asked him and to which he didn't give an answer. When Sue Gray produces all of the facts in her full report after the police investigation, will he commit to publish it immediately and in full? Uh, Mr Speaker, what we've got to do, uh, Sue Gray, is, is, is wait, for the, wait, for the, wait, for, uh, wait for the police to conclude their inquiries, Mr Speaker. That is the proper thing to do. People have given uh, all sorts of evidence in the expectation that it would not necessarily uh, be published, Mr Speaker. Uh, at that stage, I will take a decision about what to publish, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I, I imagine that I'm going to be asked to wait for something else. Um, but can I just simply ask the Prime Minister, was the Prime Minister present at the event in his flat on the 13th of November. I assume he doesn't need other people to tell him whether he was there or not. Um, was he at the flat event listed in the report on the 13th of November? Uh, Mr Speaker, I am very grateful to the uh, uh, Honourable Lady for inviting me to, to comment on something that is uh, being investigated. Uh, but I, 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 with great respect to her, I am simply not going to indulge in running commentary. She will have to wait, Mr Speaker. Sir Robert Butland, Mr Speaker, saying sorry is very important, but my right honourable friend will be judged by the deeds that he undertakes as a result. I heard today a proper acknowledgement that he needs to look in the mirror, and I am glad to hear about reforms to the centre of government that I think are timely. In fact, they are overdue, as he knows from previous conversations I've had with him. But will he give me and the House this undertaking today, that in cooperating with the Metropolitan Police Inquiry, he will show uh, the appropriate tone and approach that I think the British public demand of him uh, as, as a person of serious purpose who is up to the level of events? That's what we expect from him now, and that's what I'll be expecting him to do. I, I thank uh, my right honourable friend very much, and I just want to stress, Mr. Speaker, that I, I have great admiration for the Metropolitan Police and full confidence in the police. And I, 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 I just suggest that they be allowed now to get on with their job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We now know that there is a criminal investigation into the party that took place on the 13th of November. 2020 in his flat to celebrate the exit of Mr Cummings. On the 8th of December last year, he came to that dispatch box and flatly denied the very idea that any such party had taken place. He's shaking his head. In answer to my honourable friend, the member for Holmesy and Wood Green, he said it had not happened. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is inadvertently, Mr Speaker, misled the House. So the very least he should do is get to that dispatch box yeah. and correct the record. Yeah. Yeah. No, Mr Speaker, I stand by what I said and I would urge 
and I would simply urge him I would simply urge him to wait for the outcome of the of the inquiry. That's what he needs to do. Dr. Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I advise my right honourable friend publicly what I have said to emissaries from his campaign team privately? <laughs> that it is truly in his interest, in the government's interest, and in the national interest that he should insist on receiving the full unredacted report immediately, as I believe he can, and that he should then publish the uncensored version without any further delay. Well, I, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend, but uh, I think extensive legal <coughs> advice has been taken uh, on this point, and uh, Sue Gray has published everything uh, that she thinks she can that is consistent with that advice. Joanna Chari. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, if the police investigation were to result in serious criminal charges necessitating a criminal trial, such as, I don't know, for example, misconduct in public office or conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, how would the Prime Minister feel about having to give evidence on oath? <laughs> Mrs. I'm not going to uh, speculate about hi hypothetical uh, 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 questions which, which, frankly, I reject. Well, Fred John, Mr. Speaker, you will know that it's a very rare event for any Prime Minister to come to this House and apologise. Uh, a difficult thing for any Prime Minister uh, to do. But on the issue of the police investigation, does my right honourable friend agree with me? that there should be due process, that there should be free and unfettered access to all at number 10, but most of all, there should be no prejudging or undermining of the police inquiry before it's concluded. Yes, I, I completely agree, and I must say I'm shocked by some of the commentary that I've heard uh, from the benches opposite about that matter today, Mr Speaker. Chris Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The thing is... This is who the Prime Minister is. Yeah. A serious failure to observe high standards, yeah. failures of leadership and judgment, excessive consumption of alcohol in a professional workplace, gatherings that should have not have been able to take place, staff too frightened to raise concerns, parties in his own private flat. A leopard doesn't change its spots, does it? Every single one who defends this will face this again and again and again because he still won't even admit to the House that when he came to us on the 13th of November and said the guidance and the rules were followed at all times and on the 1st of December that all the guidelines were observed that those things simply were not true. If he won't correct the record today there's nothing accidental about this, is there? It's deliberate. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what he's uh, trying to say, Mr. Speaker, but oh. look, look, look I, I direct him again to the uh, point made by Sue Gray uh, that no conclusions should be drawn or inferences made uh, from this, other than it is now time for the police to consider the relevant material. And that is what the House should allow them, frankly, to do. Shall we, Speaker? Speaker. It is absolutely right that over the past few weeks, our constituents across the House have been writing to us on this hugely important issue, and I don't in any way wish to minimise its importance. But in my constituency, I have military bases, and I am receiving emails from families who are concerned about their loved ones and the potential role they may end up playing given the conflict on the Russian-Ukrainian border. Members opposite may <coughs> treat this lightly, but for the families, but families who have those serving in the military do not treat it lightly. Would my right honourable friend give me an assurance that notwithstanding the importance of the issue that we are discussing at present, his government will start addressing other important matters that concern my constituents and the constituents of people across this house? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
thank him very much indeed, and I think he's completely right. That the, of course, these matters are important. We've got to wait for the, uh, for the inquiry. But in the meantime, the UK has got to play uh, the leading role that we are, Mr Speaker, in bringing the West together to, le- to make a united front against Vladimir Putin, particularly with the economic sanctions that we need, Mr Speaker. That is uh, the priority of the government right now. Colin Beastman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. While the Prime Minister was eating birthday cake with his pals, people were standing outside nursing uh, home windows looking in at their loved ones dying. And contrary to what the Prime Minister has said, from that very dispatch box multiple times, any objective reading of Sue Gray's update makes it absolutely clear that the rules were broken multiple times in Downing Street. Will the Prime Minister continue a habit of a lifetime and keep blaming everybody else, or will he finally stand up, take responsibility, and just go? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he's really got to read the report, and he's got to, he's got to look at the report, and he's got to, he's got to wait. Mr. Speaker, all, everything he said, I'm afraid, is not substantiated by the report. Uh, he should look uh, and wait for the uh, for the police inquiry. Steve Baker, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Millions of people, millions of people, took seriously a communications campaign, apparently designed by behavioural psychologists, to bully, to shame, and to terrify them into compliance with minute restrictions on their freedom. What is my right honourable friend's central message to those people who meticulously complied with all of the rules and suffered terribly for it, including, I might say, those people whose mental health will have suffered appallingly as a result of the messages his government was sending out? Mr Speaker, I, I want to thank all those people uh, for everything that they did, uh, because together uh, they have helped us to control uh, coronavirus, and I think thanks to their amazing actions in coming forward uh, to get vaccinated, we're now in a far better position than many other countries around the world. So I have a massive debt of gratitude to all the people that he describes. Then Diana Johnson. Question asked by my honourable friend, the member for Birmingham Yardley. I'm not asking for a running commentary, but I would like to know whether the Prime Minister was present in his flat at the event on the 13th of November 2020. I'm really grateful to him, Mr Speaker, and I understand why people want me to elaborate on all sorts of points, but I'm not going to make a running commentary on a matter that is now being uh, considered uh, by the authorities. I've got to wait for them to conclude. Andrew Jones. The update that we have from Sue Gray today is, as she says herself, extremely limited, and that it is not possible at present to provide a meaningful report. So will my right honourable friend confirm that at the earliest opportunity he will have the report published in full? Oh, Mr Speaker, what we will do is uh, wait until the police have concluded uh, their inquiries and then see what more uh, we can publish. That is what we are going to do. Catherine West. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. As the Prime Minister will recall, on the 8th of December in Prime Minister's questions, I asked him, was there a party in Downing Street on the 13th of November? And now the report says, in the bullet point on the first page, that there was a gathering in the number 10 Downing Street flat, a gathering in the number 10 Downing Street on the departure of a special adviser. Did he inadvertently mislead this House, put us all out of our agony and stop dragging democracy through the mud. Mr Speaker, I I, I stick by what I said to her, and she should wait. uh, If she cares about democracy and due process, she should wait until until the inquiry has been concluded. Mark Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a non-drinker, who long ago realised that sobriety delivers everything that alcohol promised. I have noticed with interest that a drinking culture exists in Downing Street and in fact predates my right honourable friend's tenure by some decades. Does he, like me, welcome Sue Gray's report and will he commit to fixing that culture? Yes, Mr Speaker, I thank you very much and uh, we are certainly, Mr Speaker, going to take up uh, the relevant parts of her recommendations and see that they are properly enforced within the, the civil service in the SPAD code. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The, 
shocking incompetence of the Met Police has meant that we have a report that has been gutted. But frankly, we didn't need Sue Gray to tell us about the level of dishonour and deception that has infected not only Downing Street, but so many in the party opposite. It has been excruciating to watch so many Tory MPs and ministers willing to defend the indefensible, calculating what's in their own party political interests rather than what's right for our country, complicit in the same decaying system where the pursuit of power trumps integrity. The Prime Minister is certainly a bad apple, but the whole tree is rotten and the whole country wants reform. Couldn't we make a start with a major overhaul of the ministerial code, given that its founding assumption that it could be policed by a Prime Minister of the day because they would be a person of honesty and integrity, that founding assumption has been so widely and comprehensively and utterly discredited. Mr Speaker, uh, of all the things that she just... We are, we are reforming the ministerial code, but of all the things that I disagree with her uh, about and what she's just said, I, I disagree with her most passionately in what she's just said about the police. I think they do an outstanding job. I think we should allow them to get on with that job, and I will await their conclusions. Thank you, Doyle Price. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. If I just uh, draw attention to uh, finding number seven uh, in this report, which documents that actually number 10 Downing Street has morphed from a small team in support of the Prime Minister to a self-indulgent bureaucracy all its own. And I personally am tired of reading Sunday newspapers which read of officials briefing against ministers, delays by things being stuck in number 10 as I speak to ministers who are getting frustrated. So can I ask my right honourable friend that as he institutes this review, Call me old-fashioned, but ministers are accountable for decisions and that they're take, take, taken in their name, not flunkies in number 10. And will he ensure that reforms properly restore ministerial accountability? Yes. Uh, I, I, th I thank her very much, and uh, I very much enjoyed our joint trip to uh, Tilbury uh, this morning. And I can tell her that, yes, I do think that it's vital, as Sue Gray says, that we learn from this and that we strengthen uh, cabinet government and the principle of ministerial uh, responsibility. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have spoken about my own experience of loss during yes. the pandemic yes. many times. Yeah. I do not claim that my experiences are special. Indeed, they were all too common. But as a member of parliament, I have a responsibility to provide a voice for the bereaved families. Make no mistake. This report is utterly damning and suggests that the Prime Minister's and the government's actions were a risk to public health. How on earth can the Prime Minister stand there and justify this? Does he now accept that his actions were a complete and absolute failure of leadership and judgment? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank him very much. And I repeat what I've said that I am deeply sorry for all the suffering that has been uh, throughout this pandemic, whether of his constituents or anyone uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, as to his, his points about uh, what is in the report, I don't think his views are substantiated by, the, uh, by what the report says, but I think he should wait to, he should wait to see uh, where the inquiry goes. And that's what I propose to do. Sir Zumbab. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right hon agree with me that those opposite have used up far too much time, far yeah. too much parliamentary yeah. time, yeah. debating this? And I can assure my right hon friends that the residents of Stourbridge, the residents of Stourbridge, they want the Prime Minister to focus on the matters that really they care about. Yeah. Just, just a moment. In fairness, the Prime Minister has to come and make the statement. No, I'm not going to attack the Prime Minister for making the statement. I certainly wouldn't expect it from his own side. Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think possibly what my, and I, I, but I want to say how strongly I agree with my, uh, nonetheless, with my, my, my honourable friend, because, uh, because uh, yes, of course, uh, it's, it's vital that we make this statement. Yes, of course, it's vital that we uh, learn from Sue Gray's report. And vital that we take action, uh, Mr. Speaker, which is what the government is doing. But it's also vital, frankly, that we get on with the people's priorities, and that is what this government is also doing. 
Christian Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, just to summarise, we've had. I didn't know there was a party. Um, there was a party, but it was a work meeting, um, and um, uh, there was a party, but um, I wasn't there. Um, why is it? The Prime Minister mentioned um, international negotiations. Why should anybody, any country, any government with whom we enter into negotiations deal um, at all and take, take um, any kind of uh, word from a government that clearly acts with mendacity of foresaw, uh, forethought from start to beginning? Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, uh, this is the government that took this country out of the EU uh, and did what was necessary, and this is the government uh, that is bringing uh, the West together to stand up against Vladimir Putin. Uh, and and those, are, those, are the, those are the important considerations. As for the rest of what he said, Mr Speaker, it's nonsense, but he should wait for the police inquiry. Speaker, um, my constituents in Scunthorpe are very keen to see the industrial energy prices fixed. Will the Prime Minister reassure me that he will not be distracted by any of this and that he will get on with the job and come forward with a solution to that issue? Uh, uh, yes, sir, I think my honourable friend is completely right. We, we not only need to address uh, consumer energy costs, we need to address, uh, address business and industrial energy costs as well. And I know that uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the Chancellor, uh, is, will be bringing forward a package of, of measures uh, as soon as he can. Kirsten Oswald. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, during his statement, the Prime Minister kept referring to we when he talks about the sorry saga that Sue Gray has reported. But, Mr. Speaker, it's his rules, it's his rule breaking, it's his inability to tell the truth about it. Yeah. That's the issue. He is the Prime Minister. Does he not take any personal responsibility at all for this disgraceful fiasco? Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've taken full responsibility throughout the pandemic. <laughs> Richard Fuller. Speaker, as with the report on Owen Paterson, I felt it was important to support the process and read the report. And that's because I think it's important to separate fact from allegation and to know what the report actually says, rather than what I would wish it to say. Yeah. Two lessons that the Leader of the Opposition needs to learn. Yeah. I promised my constituents that I would ask the Prime Minister to say that he would support the recommendations in the report. There are four. That every government department has a clear and robust policy in place covering the consumption of alcohol in the workplace. That access to the garden, including for meetings, should be invitation only and a controlled environment. That there should be easier ways for staff to raise such concerns basically whistleblowing, and that too much responsibility and expectation is placed on the senior official whose principal function is the direct support of the Prime Minister. Those are the facts and the findings of the report. Will the Prime Minister accept them in full? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I, I do. And as I said to the House earlier on, I accept the findings of the report uh, in full, uh, the general findings, and uh, we, we are immediately taking steps to implement the changes. Maria Riedel. The Prime Minister has just said he accepts the findings of the report. One of them says that there were failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of Number 10 in the Cabinet Office at different times. He provides the political leadership and the political judgment at Number 10. Does he accept his own personal wrongdoing and failings in this regard? Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr Speaker, not only have I accepted full responsibility uh, throughout, uh, but I, I have apologised uh, repeatedly to the House for any misjudgments that I may have made myself. Uh, but again, I, I must urge her to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. Aaron Bell. It seems a lot of people attended events in May 2020. The one I recall attending was my grandmother's funeral. She was a wonderful woman, as well as a love for her family. She served her community as a councillor, and she served Dartford Conservative Association loyally for many years. I drove for three hours from Staffordshire to Kent. Only ten people at the funeral. Many people who loved her had to watch online. I didn't hug my siblings. I didn't hug my parents. I gave a eulogy. And then afterwards, I didn't even go to her house for a cup of tea. I drove back three hours from Kent to Staffordshire. Does the Prime Minister think I'm a fool? No, Mr Speaker. I, and I want to thank my honourable friend. And I want to, I, and I want to say how deeply I sympathise with him uh, and his family. Uh, for their loss. Uh, and all I can say is, uh, again, that uh, I'm very, very sorry for misjudgments that may be made in, uh, by me or anybody else in Number 10 uh, and the Cabinet Office. And I, I can only uh, ask him respectfully, uh, Mr Speaker, to look at what Sue Gray has said 
but also to look at the to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. I'm effort. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's important that this House can trust what ministers tell us from that dispatch box. And on the 8th of December, and regarding events at Number 10 Downing Street, the, minister, the Prime Minister said, "I repeat that I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no COVID rules were broken. That is what I have been repeatedly assured." Now, the people who gave him those assurances led to him inadvertently misleading the House. So have those people faced any disciplinary proceedings? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, first of all, he needs to, to I'm afraid, to, to await the conclusions of the police inquiry, uh, because uh, he, I, I'm afraid the, uh, he, the, the premise of his question may, not, or may or may not be uh, substantiated. But what I can tell the House is, yes, as I've said before, there certainly, there certainly uh, will be changes in the way we do things and changes in number 10. Duncan Baker. Speaker. North Norfolk consistently had some of the lowest levels of infection in the country. We followed the rules. So many of my constituents have been incensed. The damage that this is doing to the government is enormous. It is about integrity and trust. Can I ask again, because people want to know, how can the Prime Minister now satisfy my constituents and assure me that full accountability and transparency on the findings of the final Grey report will swiftly follow. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I will do whatever I can to ensure that this House has as much clarity as possible. There are legal issues uh, that, that we face, uh, Mr Speaker, about some of the, some of the testimony that has been, uh, that has been given. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what I, th I think uh, Sue Gray wants uh, us to do is to wait for the conclusion of the, uh, of the investigation, of the inquiry, and to see where that goes, and, and to support the police in their work. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister need somebody else to tell him whether he was there or he is there now? Uh, I, I refer the honourable lady to the answer I've already given. Simon Baines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, we all recognise that Number 10 Downing Street is an unusual amalgam of workplace, office space, and private home. What steps will the Prime Minister take um, to ensure that the lines between each of them are made clearer in the future? Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's, uh, you will see that there are uh, uh, reference to that uh, very problem in Sue Gray's. Uh, report, and we are going to take steps, uh, Mr. Speaker, to uh, clarify things and to make sure uh, there, are, there is greater transparency in the lines of, of command. Stephen Timms. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Prime Minister recognise that repeatedly making statements, including from that dispatch box, which turn out subsequently to be untrue, is a serious problem, or does he not recognise that? <laughs> Uh, and Mrs. Mrs. Speaker, I really think he's prejudging things and he should wait for the conclusion of the, of the inquiries. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I welcome the fact that my right honourable friend has come to this House as a first step in responding to this report. He's also rightly outlined that the relationship between Number 10 and this House needs to improve. So, will he reassure me that he'll continue to come to this House to update us on the implementation of the recommendations in Sue Gray's report and how that will happen? Um, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, I will, of course, I'm only too happy to uh, assure the House that we intend to uh, make changes starting from now, and uh, I will keep the House updated. Paul Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When there's a failure of leadership and an inappropriate culture in an organisation, the person at the top should go. This outrageous debacle hasn't happened in spite of the Prime Minister. This has happened because of the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister now do the right thing and resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, the answer is no, because I'm going to wait for the, uh, conclusions, of the, uh, the conclusions of the inquiry uh, before, before uh, all the, any of the assertions that she's made can be established. Frank Smith. Mr Speaker, I... Thank the Prime Minister for his 
statement, particularly the acknowledgement of the enormous sacrifice that so many British people went through. And as somebody who was unable to say goodbye to my grandparents this time last year, can I welcome his sincere apology. But as we, as we wait, as we wait for the Metropolitan Police findings, can my right hon. Friend give me a categoric assurance that it will be full speed ahead on fixing the Northern Ireland Protocol, standing up for our friends in Ukraine and fixing the cost of living crisis? Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, that is exactly what this Government is going to do, and nor will we be distracted for one minute. Yeah. Wayne David. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the, the general findings to a secu- a Sir, a Sir Gray's report, there is a reference to the failure of leadership and judgment by Number 10. Does the Prime Minister accept that Sue Gray was largely referring to him? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mr Speaker, I really think that he should uh, recite the the whole report, uh, but I have told him that I accept the findings uh, findings, uh, that Sue Gray has given in full, and we are acting on them today. Speaker, I I welcome my right honourable friend's apology. He's taken responsibility, he's apologised, and it's right that he should do so. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, confirm that tackling the small boats crisis will remain top of the new office of the Prime Minister? Because that's what the country wants to see. We want to see this Prime Minister getting on with the job. Yes, that's right, Mr Speaker, and that's why we brought forward the Nationalities and Borders Bill, which I'm delighted to say that she uh, supports that this government is getting through, which that party voted against. Stephen Farley. Thank you. The flippancy of some of the answers today and the non answers to other questions do not suggest that the Prime Minister is generally that sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Does he recognise the long term damage he risks doing to historic norms of democracy? Is it right that they are sacrificed for the interests of one man who refused to do what the country knows needs to happen? And can he point to one single example where he personally has improved standards in public life? <laughs> How about, Mr Speaker, uh, deciding to uh, honour the wishes of the people yeah. and deliver Brexit in spite of their attempts, Mr yeah. Speaker, to subvert democracy? Yeah. Rob Roberts. Mr Speaker, delivery is key. The Prime Minister delivers. He delivered on Brexit. He delivered with furlough and with the self-employed scheme that ensured businesses were able to survive. They can shout it down because they don't like it, Mr Speaker, that's fine. He delivered with one of the best vaccination programmes in the world. He delivered a country that is coming out of a pandemic and an economy that is thriving with people who sadly lost their jobs in the last two years having more vacancies than ever to choose from. But nobody talks about those things, Mr Speaker, because all sides of those things... I think the Prime Minister may have just got a grip of what you've had to say. <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, we're going to deliver on the people's priorities and we're going to deliver and keep delivering for Wales. Yeah. Florence Session, though, mate. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, one of the hardest things I had to do as an MP is speak to the family of Ishmael Mohammed Abdullahi. He was 13 years old when he died on the 30th of March. He was one of the youngest people to lose his life to COVID. I will admit, Mr Speaker, when I spoke to his mother, I broke down on that call. Ishmael's family, like so many other constituents up and down in Vauxhall, followed the rule. Many of them were scared to go out. Many of them had to bury their loved ones without being there. Many of them walked past the COVID memorial wall in my constituency with that heart showing their loss. Does the Prime Minister now understand and does he not feel ashamed that his actions have brought disrepute to the office that he holds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course I uh, share the uh, Honourable Lady's grief uh, for Ishmael. Uh, I sympathise with uh, Ishmael's family, and I, I understand the pain and loss that everybody has experienced throughout this country. Uh, uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, all I can say is that uh, I will continue to do my best to fight COVID as I have done uh, throughout this pandemic 
and, and to deliver for the British people. And I can't say more than that. Mark Lowe, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, running an office and, the, and the, having the required management expertise of running literally dozens and dozens of offices with hundreds and hundreds of people within is one thing. Running the country and getting the big decisions right are quite another. So can I welcome the Prime Minister's commitment to have a, a look at what is happening at number 10 and those management structures so that we can deliver on the promises and the yeah. Brexit promises we gave the people of this country? Yeah. I, I thank him very much and that's why we're taking up the findings of the, uh, the Sue Gray report. We want to make sure that number 10 uh, works uh, better, that the whole of the government uh, works better, that it's been focused very much on, uh, on COVID, uh, but we now need to deliver exclusively on the, on the great priorities of the people. Anna Balder. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last summer, my team and I said goodbye to our colleague through the window of her hospice as she died of cancer. We didn't get to hug her, and we were just like many millions of people across the UK. We followed the rules, while he and his colleagues didn't. And it makes me sick to my stomach that we are not going to get the findings of this report because the police were so late to the party. The same Met Police who were happy to arrest women who were protesting the murder of Sarah Everard. And it makes me sick to my stomach that he does not understand the anger and fury and upset of millions of people across the UK. Because sometimes, Mr Speaker, an apology won't cut it. It's time for action. It's time for a clear out. It's time for him to resign. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, again, I, I sympathise very much with the experience of uh, her constituents uh, and, and all the pain that people have gone through throughout this pandemic. Uh, I must say to her, though, that she is prejudging uh, the issue that the issue in, in question today. I don't think that's the right thing to do. Uh, I have uh, a great deal of respect for the police, and I think they should be allowed to get on with their job. Paul Hull. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think we've got to remember that we're all talking about the breaking of the rules and the rules clearly are under question here as to what's happened. But the rules themselves that were put out by this government have got this country to where it is. And we've got to remember that those rules did the right thing. So yes, there's got to be consequences in number 10 for any rules that have been broken. But please remember the right thing was done by the instigation of the rules in the first place. And I have to say... When I'm talking to my constituents out there, they're saying, yes, we need to ask the question about what's happened there, but can we stop being that as the only sole subject? And can the opposition talk about something else as well, please? Do we need to move on and level up this country? I, I thank my honourable friend very much, and I think, I think he's right. The, the rules are important, and it was, very, it was, it was, it was amazing, and it remains amazing, uh, to see the way people pulled together throughout the, the pandemic. And I, I thank people very much. Uh, but what we need to do, if we possibly can, uh, Mr Speaker, if, if, the, if the opposition would, uh, w w I think would, uh, would, would agree, uh, we now need to focus on the issues that matter above all to the British people. Fixing the cost of living, rebuilding our economy, clearing the COVID backlogs. That's what this government is doing. Barry Sherman. Speaker. I have known the Prime Minister a long time, um, and we've always got on quite well. Mm. He's not a wicked man, but he's a man that for years, in every job, has got by flying on the seat of his pants. <laughs> he has a chaotic management style, and that is a question of character. And can I ask him, really, to look in the mirror, as he said this morning, and say, am I the man at this challenging time for our country? abroad, at home, in every sense, has he the character to carry on and do that job properly? No. No. Yes, Mr Speaker, because quite frankly, uh, I think it was absolutely indispensable that we had a strong number 10 uh, that was able to take us out of the EU in spite of all the efforts of the party opposite uh, to block it, and not only that, Mr Speaker, a, a booster and a vaccine campaign that were led by Number 10 that have made a dramatic difference, not just to the health of this country, but to the economic fortunes of this country. And whatever he says about me and my leadership, that is what we have delivered in the last year alone. Scott Benson. 
you, Mr. Speaker. When knocking in doors in Blackpool at the weekend, I spoke to Julie, who said this. This Prime Minister has had the most difficult job in living history. He's been dealing with a pandemic in which he nearly died. He's been dealing with the media who haven't forgiven him for delivering Brexit. And yet, let's... He's been dealing with the media who haven't forgiven him yet for dealing with Brexit and he hasn't had a chance to crack on and deliver yet for the British people on their priorities. The report today has come out. The Prime Minister has apologised. Let's allow him to get on and deal with oh, oh. oh, what he wants to hear. Sir. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I want to say how passionately, vehemently and emphatically I agree uh, with, the, with the remarks, which I couldn't quite hear, uh, of my, of my honourable friend. He is completely right, Mr Speaker, and I think that is the priority of the British people. That's the priority of the government. Brams. Limited as the Grey report uh, was, uh, we know that the, the, the findings are still incredibly damning. Uh, multiple issues around uh, failures of leadership and judgment. Now, given that the Nolan principles and the standards of public life describe the centrality of integrity, honesty, and leadership, how can the Prime Minister continue? I really think that she needs to read the report carefully, Mr Speaker, uh, and, 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 and I'm afraid that the conclusions that she's drawing are not ones that I support, but what we are doing, Mr Speaker, is, is following Sue Gray's advice, and we are changing the way Number 10 runs, and we are going to, uh, to do things differently, Mr Speaker, but I, I can't agree uh, with what she says. Catherine Fletcher. Mr Speaker, on Saturday I was out and about enjoying ice cream in Lancashire, which I know you and your family do in some of the finest ice cream parlours in the north of England, and they said to me, he's a Wally, but 100,000 Russians have just turned up. Well, uh, what the bloody hell are we doing talking about cake? Does the Prime Minister agree with that statement? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I thank her very much. Uh, I thank her very much, and I think that what the country, what the country needs, and what the West needs. Sorry. Can I just say, if you don't want to carry on the question, I'm happy to pull stumps now. But if we are going to have questions, I'm going to hear the answers as well as the questions. Prime Minister, standing up, mate. You're going to have to sit down for a bit. What the country needs now, Mr. Speaker, is a UK government uh, working with our friends and partners to stand up to Vladimir Putin and to make sure that we have a strong package of sanctions, and that's what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister sets the culture at number 10. Why does he think that staff members there felt unable to raise their concerns about the bad behaviours reported in today? Oh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that is one of the recommendations of the, uh, the Sue Gray inquiry that we are going to take up to make sure that nobody uh, should feel that uh, in number 10. And uh, that's why we're going to review the code uh, to ensure that nobody feels that they have uh, any inhibition on coming forward with any complaint uh, that they may have. Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister and his allies are trying to distract and deflect from the truth. But here are the indisputable facts. The Prime Minister attended Downing Street parties. He told this House and the people that we represent that he attended no parties and, in fact, that there were no parties. The rules were clearly broken. The ministerial code has been violated. So when will he stop, stop in, insulting the intelligence of the British people and do the right thing and resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I really think she's got to let the Metropolitan Police get on and do their job. Brendan Brendan O'Hara. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister not recognise that the public are rapidly losing faith in the institutions that they must be able to trust if our democracy is to survive? Because it appears that there is no individual, no organisation, no group or no force whose reputation won't be sacrificed on the altar of saving this Prime Minister. So can I ask the Prime Minister, does he consider the erosion of public trust in the foundations of our democracy a price worth paying to ensure his personal survival? Mr Speaker, I believe that the foundations of, amongst the foundations of our democracy uh, are due process in the rule of law and allowing the police to get on with their job. And that's what we're going to do. Luke Pollard. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Part four of Sue Gray's report says that there is an ex a culture of excessive consumption of alcohol, which is not appropriate. Is there also a culture of excessive drug taking in Downing Street? Right. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, any drug taking would be excessive. Uh, perhaps he should direct that question at the Labour front bench. Direct to a... Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, uh, we have heard all about prejudging things today. We only have to look at paragraph 3 of the general findings, which talks about failures of leadership, judgment in different parts of number 10 in the Cabinet Office, and it says some events should never have been allowed to take place and other events should not have been allowed to develop as they did. I think that's prejudging anything, it's very clear. It's only one person in charge of number 10 in, in totality, and that's the Prime Minister. So let me just remind the Prime Minister why this matters about this rule breaking and the way number 10 behaved. Let me quote a constituent, one of a number of emails I had from constituents who lost loved ones. She said to me, We received a call at 11.15 pm on the 29th of May 2020 saying Mum was deteriorating. Both my sister and I drove to the home and spent the night sat on a chair outside her bedroom window watching her die. All I could do was sob and shout to her and tell her that I loved her. I couldn't even hold her hand. That's why you should go, Prime Minister. Yeah, 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 yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I totally understand uh, the feelings of his, uh, his constituents and uh, I accept that uh, things could have been done better in, uh, in number 10, as I've told the House before. But uh, really, I, I must ask him to uh, study what uh, Sue Gray has said. Uh, and, 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 and we are acting on all her recommendations. Nadine Whitton. Which one of them, Mr. Speaker? Oh, Nadine's over there. She's there. Nadine Whitton. Yeah, go on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister explain how changing the civil service hierarchy will prevent him from breaching the COVID regulations, as he has admitted in this House? When will he take responsibility for his own actions, stop hiding behind other people? My constituents don't want another government department. They want him to resign. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, she's wrong in what she said, and I directed what I've uh, said earlier on. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's been further revealed that in April 2021, as the Prime Minister partied, he also swiftly rejected the idea of bereavement bubbles for those who'd lost loved ones, <laughs> suffered miscarriages, stillbirths or a child neonatal death. Far from getting it, he's deflected, laughed and smirked his way through this statement. He's a disingenuous man, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, no, uh, this has been uh, a harrowing and tragic experience for the entire country. Uh, we've done our best to, uh, to deal with it. And uh, I, as for what she says about what's been going on in Number 10, uh, I, I ask her to look at the report, but also to wait for the, uh, the police inquiry. Owen Thompson. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, this afternoon we've heard the distraction, the deflection, there's confusion, and we can't even get the answers to the most simplest of questions about whether we can actually get the full report published when it's available. So, Mr Speaker, could I ask the Prime Minister, is it the case now that we're looking at a situation of hobble, hobble, quack, quack? Yeah. 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 Minister. Mr Speaker, I... I and nothing would uh, give me greater pleasure than to publish everything that uh, we currently have. But the fact is, Mr Speaker, that there are legal impediments and we have to wait until uh, the police inquiry is concluded. Sir William Cash. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I, I accept entirely what the Prime Minister has just said. It is absolutely essential that we wait. It in, it's absolutely essential that we wait until we hear the next stage in this these proceedings in relation to any future investigations. I'd also like to draw attention to the historic achievements of this Prime Minister in relation, in relation to not only delivering Brexit, but in relation to delivering the vaccine rollout and in relation to his dealings with Mr Putin. And I believe that everybody should take that most firmly into account. Yeah. 
I, I thank you very much, I, and I think he's completely right. Uh, and uh, he might have added, by the way, that we have the fastest economic growth in the G7, uh, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the steps this government uh, has been taking. Terence. Mr. Speaker, we've established that there were parties. We are just really arguing about who is responsible. And as the Honourable Member for Thurrock said earlier, that's a minister. So if it's not him, is it the member for Surrey, Heath or North East Cambridgeshire who should be facing the sack? Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, I remind the Honourable Lady what Sue Gray says in her uh, paragraph. Well, no such conclusion can be drawn uh, so far, Mr. Speaker. She, she must wait. Uh, she must wait for uh, the conclusion of the inquiry. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister announced at the weekend that he would be calling President Putin to urge de-escalation of the situation in Ukraine. The Mirror have just reported uh, that today the call has been cancelled because he's been dealing with the Sue Gray report. So can the Prime Minister confirm that on a matter of such grave importance that this report is correct and that we will be speaking to Vladimir Putin as soon as he leaves the chamber? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I will be speaking to President Putin as soon as I can. Leila Brav. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There, I have read the report in full, and I think the most striking sentence was the one that there were failures of leadership and judgment in different parts of Number 10 and the Cabinet Office at different times. My constituents have been writing to me whilst the Prime Minister has been speaking, say that he should resign, but they also want to know the full facts. Once the Met has concluded, why could he not then publish the full unredacted report? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to see uh, where the police get to. We have to see the conclusion of their inquiry. We have to see what the legal position is then, Mr. Speaker. Mohammed Jassim. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My constituents are deeply troubled and angry by the frequent scandals engulfing the Prime Minister's administration. Because it's not just the party gate and ongoing cover up, but, but all the other things the proroguing of Parliament the treatment of the Queen, the $3.5 billion of chronic COVID contracts, the writing of $4.3 billion COVID loan fraud, and the Russia report, to name but a few. Sussex University researchers have warned that Boris Johnson's administration is more corrupt than any other administration since the Second World War. Does the Prime Minister know this, doesn't he? Prime Minister, didn't well, I, I think the honourable gentleman's point is completely ridiculous. He mentions, uh, he mentions what we did, uh, for instance, to get Brexit done, which was absolutely crucial to restore public trust in democracy. Richard Holden. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Like me, many of my constituents have been appalled by the reports of what's been happening in Number 10, and will welcome the fact that my right honourable friend has come to the House today and has apologised in a first step to responding to this. Will he assure me that he will continue to keep the House updated on the implementation of the measures he's taking in the report? And also, will he ensure that there's full cooperation from the whole of the Number 10 team uh, to the inquiries from the Met, so they conclude as swiftly as possible? Prime Minister. Uh, Yes, Mr. Speaker, of course I will keep the House updated, and of course uh, everybody in, num in Number 10 will cooperate uh, to the full uh, with the Met. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is surely now a new low. A Prime Minister of our country forced to come here to the Mother of Parliaments and plead the fifth in a criminal investigation because he knows if the truth is told, it will incriminate himself. So let me just ask the Prime Minister a simple question. If he cannot get his facts straight about whether or not he was at a party in his own flat, how will anyone in this House ever believe a word he says again, and how will our partners around the world ever put their trust in him? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to uh, dignify that question with an answer, except to say, uh, except to say that he's got to wait. Everything he said is completely prejudicial. Alan Brown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thought people of Lancashire were supposed to be straight speaking because I, I can assure, assure people that my constituents are calling the Prime Minister a lot more than a wally, words I can't repeat. The reality is here we've got staff were too frightened to raise concerns about behaviour they, they knew were ongoing. Half the staff invited to bring your own booze party didn't turn up because they knew it was wrong, but yet the Prime Minister said he thought it was a work event and within the rules. 
His lack of leadership and judgment is also shown by the Let the Bodies Pile high comment about a second lockdown. The one thing the Leader of Scottish Tories has said that is true is this Prime Minister is not fit for office. Now, given he'll do anything to save his own skin, does that mean the Leader of Scottish Tories is going to get binned as well? <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I direct him to what I have said earlier on. Mick Whitley. I think yeah, no, no one said in this House here this afternoon that 155,000 people died of COVID. That is why we introduced the rules. But this is simply not the comprehensive report that the British public were promised for so long. But at least it is clear in its findings that there were serious failures. And I quote, to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the House of Government, but also the standards expected of the entire British population at the height of the pandemic. Does the Prime Minister accept responsibility for his failure to live up to the standards which the rest of us would expect to uphold? Mr Speaker, I take responsibility for everything uh, that happened in number 10 and that the government did throughout the pandemic. Harry Gardner. The great report is clear that there should be no excessive consumption of alcohol in a workplace. Can the Prime Minister therefore assure the House that his own consumption of alcohol was not excessive and, in particular, that his judgment was at no time so clouded that he was in danger of telling the truth? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I couldn't quite hear the end of the uh, right honourable gentleman's question, uh, but the answer is no. If he thinks I was I, I, I drunk too much, no. Which Norris? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister wants my constituents to suspend their disbelief and wait for the Met Police to report. In which case, will he at least give them clarity that should the Metropolitan Police issue him with a fixed penalty notice for participation at his party, he will resign? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, he really needs to wait and see what the, what the Met uh, decide. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. We've had excessive whataboutery, bluster and bravado from the Prime Minister. I suggest to him politely that we need a lot more humility from him, given that whilst the Grey Report might be paper thin, it's very clear in the serious failings at number 10. Fish rots from its head. Can I suggest to the Prime Minister it's not a new Prime Minister's office we need, it's a new Prime Minister? Well, I, I, I hear him and I simply repeat what I have said earlier on. Uh, I am grateful to Sue Gray for taking action uh, following her report, but he needs to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Sue Gray has made it clear that this is not a report, but it's an update on the investigation into COVID breaches in Downing Street. Indeed, her, in her update, Ms Gray says she is extremely limited in what she can say and, yep. quote, it is not possible at present to provide a meaningful report. If it is the case that there is nothing to see here, move on, as the Prime Minister today is desperately trying to convince us, why has he repeatedly refused to commit to publish the full report even after the police investigation has completed? <coughs> yep. And what does it say about the benches opposite, those populating them, if they still them? genuinely think that he is the best amongst them to be <laughs> Prime Minister? <laughs> That's not what I've said. Neil Coyle. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister told Parliament and told the British people that there were no parties. We now know he attended several, including one at which he was ambushed with cake in his most pathetic excuse yet. Given his previous statements, which we know to be patently false, how does he explain why this report says at least 12 parties in his home warrant police investigation? Prime Mr Speaker, he's proved several times in that question that he hasn't got the faintest idea what he's talking about and he should wait for the outcome of the inquiry. Rupa Hart. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister and his apologists up to now have explained these things away as one-offs, you know, a work do, uh, ambushed by a cake, all those kind of things. But this report makes clear that it was a repeated pattern of behaviour, yeah. the booze-ups after work that nobody else was having, all our constituents who followed the rules. So can I ask him as well, it also says that there was 
there's an investigation of a Downing Street party on the 13th of November 2020. Why did he tell my honourable friend for Hornsey and Wood Green on the 8th of December that no such gathering took place? And subsequently, he's told my right honourable friend, our leader, that anyone who from that dispatch box tells mistruths should resign. Is he a man of his words? Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, she needs to, to look at what I said, and she needs to look at the outcome. She needs to look at the outcome of the inquiry. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister said in a statement earlier that he understands the anger of people in this country, but does he also understand that while they've been watching this? For many people in this country, their greatest fears about how this would be handled have been realised. They have seen an apology, yes, but obfuscation, delay, tinkering, rather than an acceptance of a responsibility. The Prime Minister says he wants to go on and deal with the important issues facing this country. Perhaps the only way we will be able to do that is for the Prime Minister to accept that he has become an obstacle to it and resign. Yeah. Minister. Uh, uh, no, Mr. Speaker, we're going to get on with the job. Yeah. 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 Jeff Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister was wrong in something he said earlier. The Sue Gray update can be both damning and incomplete. And most of us can only guess how much more damning the full report is going to be. And his colleagues should worry about that. But I think he knows how bad it's going to be because he knows what's gone on. So isn't that the real reason why he won't commit to publishing the report in full when the police have completed their investigation? Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, he's totally prejudging the whole thing. He needs to contain himself. No, he needs to contain himself and wait for the police to complete their inquiries. Drew Hendry. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Sue Gray update is not the report that this House deserves. It is not the transparency that the public were expecting. Yeah. But it does make it very clear that were, there were failures of leadership at number 10. The Prime Minister is the leader at number 10. Yeah. So will he now pack his suitcase or will he leave it to his officials to carry his cans? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, he, he just needs to, to look at the uh, report again and he needs to wait for the conclusions of the inquiry. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Look her in the eyes and tell her you never bend the rules. A lot of us remember that campaign. It cost tens of millions of taxpayers' money. On the 13th of November in 2020, he bent the rules, didn't he? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I refer him to what I've said earlier on in this House. And uh, frankly, Mr. Speaker, he needs to wait until the conclusion of the police inquiry. Stephen Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This morning, the Conservative Party in Scotland issued a press release, and it stated, and I quote, "The pandemic sees rise in criminals getting away with crimes." <laughs> Were they talking about the Prime Minister? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, what we're actually doing is cutting crime. Uh, by 40 per cent, putting uh, 20,000 more, 20, more police on the streets. Roshanara Ali. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Week in, week out, throughout this pandemic, I, like many of my colleagues, had to deal with constituents who couldn't see their dying relatives or grieve with them. And some of us were directly affected when we lost family members and loved ones. The Prime Minister's actions have made a mockery of the British people's sacrifices during the pandemic. And now he's the subject of a criminal investigation. It's a new low for our country and our democracy, and it makes a mockery of our democracy to the rest of the world. If the Prime Minister takes responsibility for everything that, he's, that has happened, as he has said, isn't it time that he put his party, this parliament, and the country out of their misery and steps down so that we can move on and focus on the national interest because at the moment it is not possible because of the crisis that he and Number 10 have created. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prime uh, uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker. Carol Monaghan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's clear that the Prime Minister has used these parties like many an under-par manager 
to buy popularity and favour. Yeah. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister tell us if he's using the same techniques when negotiating treaties and trade deals with international leaders? Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today should have been about contrition and remorse, and it seems that the Prime Minister does not understand the meaning of sorry. Instead, it has insulted the people that have suffered and sacrificed for the last two years. One question that many people want to know is who is paying for these investigations, the police and uh, Sue Gray's report, and who is paying for his legal advice? Is it the taxpayer? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I must say, I think that uh, uh, she's wrong in what she says. Uh, as, as for who is, co- who is covering the police costs, uh, the police are covering uh, the police costs. Daisy Cooper. Peter. If he had read as far as the front cover, he would see it was called an update. It is because it is an update that it makes public trust in the Met's investigation even more important. The public must know that the Met will investigate without fear or favour. So can the Prime Minister confirm that not at any single stage anybody in Number 10 or the Cabinet Office has sought to influence the Met's decision on delaying its initial investigation, or was the delay a result of its own incompetence? No, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, the only people calling into question the the Met's independence uh, are, I think, the the, the, the side opposite on on her benches. Thank you. The Prime Minister has seriously misjudged the mood of the country, and indeed he has misjudged the mood of his own backbenches. My constituent wrote to me devastated and upset. He couldn't see his disabled son his elderly mother with dementia and his newborn child putting a serious toll on his mental health. Like millions across the country, he followed the rules, but the Prime Minister thinks he's above the rules. Instead, he blames his civil service and he restructures. Will he do the decent thing and resign? Mr Speaker, I disagree with her profoundly because I, 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 I do understand uh, people's feelings, and I do understand why uh, this is so important for people. Yeah. But uh, I, I must say that I think the best thing now is for the uh, inquiry to be concluded, and in the meantime, for us all to get on with the work that I think everybody wants us to do. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I have enjoyed the exercise this afternoon. <laughs> I've also like, wanted to enjoy the Prime Minister's answers to questions, but unfortunately, he's duck dived, he's done everything yep. but answer questions yep. about a party on the 13th yep. of November, about whether he'll put out the final report. Okay, I'll ask him one more. I asked already. If you get a fine, a fixed penalty fine from the Metropolitan Police after all this. It's over. Will you pay it yourself or ask a Tory donor to pay it for you? Uh, Mr Speaker, there's a process. We've got to wait for it to conclude. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Among those who were the most isolated during the pandemic were people with learning disabilities, cut off from visits from their families, not even allowed an advocate if they were admitted to hospital. For too many, restrictions to services and the awful isolation without visitors that the PM's rules expected them to follow were a matter of life and death. The mortality rate for people with learning disabilities from COVID was eight times that of the general population. When he thinks about the damage done to all those groups who are so isolated and their families and the serious failings of leadership and judgment in number 10 found by this independent investigation, how can he think his position is tenable? Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, she's entirely right about the, the suffering of people with learning disabilities and indeed all vulnerable groups who are exposed to, uh, to, to lockdowns for, for long periods. And that's why actually uh, we worked so hard uh, to make sure that we could get this country out of lockdown and keep it out of lockdown. And that was our objective. Stuart Housie. Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I don't need to wait for the full Sue Gray report, because this one tells me one important fact. There were a heck of a lot of parties. So can I ask the, there were a heck of a lot 
of parties, Prime Minister. So let me ask the Prime Minister, at which point during this catalogue of frivolity, while he was clearing last night's empty wine bottles off his desk before settling down to work the following afternoon, <laughs> did he conclude that having one rule for him and another one for the general public was undermining his own health messaging and costing people's lives? Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, I mean, Mr. Deputy Speaker, he, uh, the, the honourable gentleman is uh, misrepresenting uh, what Sue Gray says. He's also, uh, perhaps inadvertently, uh, but he's also completely misrepresenting uh, what happened. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This report confirms what we already know, the abject failure in leadership at number 10. So will the Prime Minister take responsibility and do what the constituents in Liverpool and Riverside are asking for, your resignation, so that we can get on and deal with the crisis facing this country? Thank you. Uh, uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker, I refer to what I have said earlier on. Justin Matters. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On 8 December, the Prime Minister told this House, and I quote, I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no COVID rules were broken. Well, just who gave him those assurances? Because given he was at some of the parties and at least one of them was his, in his own flat, he shouldn't need anyone else to tell him what happened. So it looks like when the Prime Minister spoke those words, he was either fooling himself or was he just trying to fool everyone else? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he needs to wait and see. He needs to wait and see uh, what the inquiry concludes, and, he, and that is what due process demands. And I stick, Mr. Speaker, by what I say. I can see eight people standing, and that is the last date I'm going to take. Just to let you know, Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Section 5.1 of the Ministerial Code says ministers must uphold the political impartiality of the civil service and not ask civil servants to act in any way which would conflict with the civil service code. And finding six of Sue Gray's report, which I have read, says some staff wanted to raise concerns about behaviours they witnessed at work, but, uh, but felt unable to do so. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that if his staff, and in fact civil servants and workers everywhere, feel afraid to raise concerns regarding inappropriate behaviour at work, that they should contact their trade union rep or join a trade union? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, that's why I've accepted the conclusions of the uh, Sue Gray findings in full, and uh, we will implement the changes. And I assume that everybody standing has also been here for the opening statement and throughout. Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've listened carefully to the statement, the questions, the answers, and indeed to my constituents, many of whom have been devastated to hear that there may have been parties, and some of whom have suffered great hardship. I'm very glad that the Prime Minister has come here to apologise and to take on board the recommendations, but I am concerned that this is taking time and attention away from key issues. This statement alone has been going on for nearly two hours. The Prime Minister has achieved great things with Brexit and vaccines, but has achieved great things with Brexit and vaccines. Can he assure this House and me and my constituents that this ongoing investigation and the reorganisation of Number 10 is not going to take his laser-like focus away from the issues that matter to them? Yeah. Uh, sir. Yes, I can uh, give my honourable friend that uh, absolute assurance. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Has a date yet been set for the Prime Minister to be interviewed by the Metropolitan Police in connection with their inquiry? <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, the, the police are independent and they must get on with their inquiry. Hey, Dugan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This reads like a dreadful, poorly written soap opera, an unbelievable soap opera. I hear members opposite saying how important it is for their constituents to go on with the day job. My constituents are incandescent at the behaviour of this Prime Minister. Will he accept the damage he's doing to the office of elected representatives, all of us, and will he do the right thing and clear out? Yeah. Prime Minister. No, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the reasons I've already given. Steve Bonner. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we do know that staff are being made to work in conditions that made them feel uneasy, perhaps even unsafe, Prime Minister. And they also felt that they were unable to say something. People exposed to a potentially deadly virus, unable to say something in their workplace, while parties were raging on around about them. 
At least some, says Mrs Gray, represent a serious failure to observe the high standards expected of those working at the heart of government. Who is responsible for that, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he's completely represent, misrepresenting uh, what took place. Gavin Newlands. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Despite the omissions from Sue Gray's update, it makes crystal clear that the office he occupies and the government he leads behaved in a despicable and disrespectful way when the public faced the yeah, gravest yeah, yeah. of threats. Does he not accept that his personal conduct before becoming Prime Minister and since is completely unacceptable and if he had any respect for his own office, the public, and did even a scintilla of integrity, he would announce his resignation to the 1922 Committee tonight? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker. Stuart Macdonald. Here, here. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask when will the various statements made by the Prime Minister from that dispatch box about the subject of parties and gatherings at Downing Street be investigated under the Ministerial Code? And isn't it absolutely classical that that's a question for the Prime Minister at all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, we have, a, we have an investigation going on. Uh, I, think it's very, I think that that's the one uh, people should focus on, and they should allow the police to get on with their job. Richard Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In his statement, the Prime Minister said, sorry for the things we did not get right, sorry for the way this has been handled, a generic non-apology that will mean absolutely nothing to anyone that's heard it. But what I and millions of others want to hear is, apart from getting caught out in all of this, what is it that the Prime Minister is personally sorry for and genuinely regretful for in terms of his own conduct? And if he just resorts back to that tired, hackneyed form of words that he used to begin with, doesn't it just show that it's not a new office of the Prime Minister that we need? It's a new Prime Minister in office. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I've re re repeated several times uh, how sorry I am for any misjudgments that, that I made, uh, and I continue to apologise uh, for them. Uh, and uh, all I can say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that we need to get on and, uh, and await the outcome of the inquiry, but it, allow the government uh, and, uh, to deliver on the priorities of this uh, country, and that is uh, to unite and level up, uh, to continue to cut crime, uh, to make colossal investments across our whole country, and that is what we are going to do. I would like to thank the Prime Minister for his statement today and asking questions for just short of two hours. I am just going to pause as uh, people leave and others take their places for the next statement. Thank you, Simon. Very good on me.